What can I say, dear? After I say I'm sorry. Welcome to the Bob and Ray Beg Your Pardon show, and we think we've done it again. That's eh? right. As serious and responsible reporters of the current scene, we should have been more careful. See, about two weeks ago, we included a shopping tip in one of our radio broadcasts. We said we knew of a place where a person could purchase a deck of Marquette cards. We thought Marquette was the name of the playing card manufacturer, but it wasn't. The word was mispronounced. It should have been pronounced marked. That's right. Marked card. So we have some apologizing to do to the gentleman seated here, and we might as well get to it. We He bought several uh, decks without realizing they were marked cards, and can you ever forgive us, Mr. Earl... Or is that Carl? Mr. Carl Eubank. What can I say to you after all right, I say right. I'm Carl. sorry? Well, it's all right. Uh, we all make mistakes. Well, uh, when was it uh, first realized that the cards were marked? Could you tell us that? Well, uh, it was at our regular Wednesday night poker game. Mm-hmm. This week's game was at my house. I think the discovery was made about 10 15. Uh, by whom, Mr. Eubank? I think George Hacker was the first to notice. Yeah. He was a big loser that night, and he was moaning and groaning about it. <laughs> well, I uh, started to deal a hand, and George jumped up and shouted, These cards are marked! And all the guys piled on me and started whacking me around. Well, I guess you know, by the looks on our face, that uh, we're pretty sorry about this, Mr. Eubank. What happened right at that point? I'll tell you that egg, too, for life. Yes. Well, I got up off the floor... And I was in pretty bad shape. I got off the floor and I said to George, uh, I'm going to cry, I'm afraid. No, I'll you, I'll pull yourself together yeah. because we do want to apologize publicly and yeah. make everything a yeah. clean slate for yeah. you. I said to George, these are not my cards, they're my kid cards. Well, what happened then? Did well, you... they jumped all over me again and by this time the whole poker group was screaming and the cards were... Were marked. Yeah. Well, that must have been rough, I can imagine. Well, it sure was. And then I told him once more. The cards were not marked, I said. They were marked dead. And were you thrown to the floor again, Mr. Eubank, well, at that this point? this time, I guess they were tired of pummeling me around. Instead, they went through the house, tearing curtains, mm-hmm. knocking over vases, uh-huh. smashing furniture, and they sure. left after they'd done about $2,700 worth of damage. Well, that certainly was more than you'd bargained for. What did you do then, Mr. Eubank? Well, I thought there had to be some reason for their acting the way they did, so I took a good look at the cards. Mm-hmm. Sure enough, they were marked. Could you tell us just how they were marked so we'll know? Well, uh, there was a house on the back of each card, but on some of the houses, the door was open, yeah. and on others, the door was shut. Mm-hmm. Some houses had smoke coming out of the chimney, and others didn't. As a matter of fact, some of the houses didn't have chimneys at all. Oh, yeah. And then there was this pathway leading to the house. And on some well, of I think we trees, understand uh, how that uh, could work. Uh, what did you do when you made this discovery, Mr. Eubank? Well, uh, Mr. Elliott, I'm not a dishonest man, so I got on the phone and I called George Hacker. I told him he'd been right. The cards were marked. Well, good. I guess that straightened things out, didn't it? No. Well, after I admitted to him on the phone that the cards were marked, he rounded up the gang and they all came back to my house. They did about another $1,200 oh, worth of additional well, damage. You certainly had a, a real bad time of it, Mr. Eubank. No <laughs> doubt of that. And I'd just like to tell you how really miserable, how really miserable we feel about all that's happened. I, I don't know how we could have made a mistake like that. And for your appearance on the show today, we'd like you to have a little gift, a deck of Marquette playing cards. He was. Oh, he didn't need to do that, Mr. Eubank. Just trying to be nice to you. He just had the bob. He had to get it out of his system, I guess. Friends, we've really done it this time. Oh, boy, I'm telling you, the walls of the Bob and Ray Overstock Warehouse are banked with sets of books all the way to the ceiling and back again. Row upon row upon countless row of magnificent sets of the encyclopedic Book of Wonder. Forty volumes to the set. That's right, friends. Approximately 140 pounds of illuminating, exciting, thought-provoking facts. And each book is covered in genuine pigskin from pigs selected at birth and nurtured along on the finest slops available. The color of the covers, a deep, 
rich maroon, which is about the color we turned when we checked the publication date of these books. December 3rd, 1899. Now, naturally, at first, we thought we'd been taken by the people who'd sold us these handsome sets. But after the first flash of white-hot rage, we decided not to prosecute, sue, or otherwise badger the individuals with whom we'd made our deal. Their loss is our gain. Friends, we're going to tell you what a set of the 1899 Encyclopedic Book of Wonder can do for you. Well, as I lead through a sample copy here, it, it comes as no small thrill to rediscover the fact that the planet Earth has an atmosphere. Now, this same thrill is available to you. Bring this piece of information on your friends. There are 12 gas stations in the United States. New York State is the leader with two. Or regale your friends with this tidbit from the Encyclopedic Book of Wonder, an excerpt from the literary section, which says, quote, Mark Twain is going places. And it's quite possible that some of you might want to know the correct procedure for dumping sandbags from a balloon. You'll find it in one of these volumes. That plus a million and a half other pieces of dated but useful knowledge. Now, there are those of you who want to get rid of the extraneous matter in the books, the pages, so you can do things with the genuine pigskin covers. Now, with 40 pigskin covers, you can fashion a 20-foot-high briefcase. Voting enthusiasts, attention, please. Be the first member of your yacht club with a maroon pigskin sail. A real eye-catcher. And if you choose to leave the pages in the books, you'll find they make dandy doorstops, handy ammunition to throw at cats. And if all the members of a family ripple the pages at once, an extraordinarily inexpensive air conditioning unit will be introduced into your home. Yes, friends, these are but some of the many benefits to be derived from these priceless volumes. All at a cost so precariously low that if it were mentioned... It would send the market into a flurry of selling, perhaps force it to close early. Well, you can keep the crate they come in, too. It can be used as a handy container for your set of the 1899 Encyclopedia Book of Wonder. Now, for more information, drop a postcard tonight to Hidebound CBS Radio, 485 Madison Avenue, New York City. And we'll get it. Good. Just you bet on that. <laughs> Bob, we have a thrilling new Private Eye series. I think tonight will be the first and last installment, according mm -hmm. to the uh, advanced previews I've heard of it. And uh, it's called Johnny Crescendo. <laughs> My name is Johnny Crescendo. You don't like it? Tough. That's my name, and I like it. And I fight to keep its good name, too. I like to hang out at a place in the village called Chico. I don't own it or nothing, but uh, it's kind of a nice warm place. Chico ain't a bad sort, and lets you run up a tab of a few bells. My occupation, sitting at a piano stool, noodling around, playing some real cool chords. Occasionally, I like to work out for $100 a day, plus expenses, tracking down some fink. It was a wet night about three months ago. I was sitting at the piano. It's creepy-looking figure came in the door and moseyed over towards me. I figured I had a real live one coming along and... Uh, you crescendo? Yeah. Mind if I uh, sit down? Not on that stool, buddy. If you want to talk to me, stand off. I want to talk business with you, crescendo. Wait just a second. I want to get a couple of cool ones. always do as bad business as this in here? Chico ain't in this for money, buddy. Now, what do you want to see me for? Well, let me tell you my story and see if you can help me. I I don't know whether you can or not. Hey, I... Just a second. Turn around. Yeah. <clears throat> That's what I thought. What? Somebody pasted a kick-me sticker on the back of your coat. Oh, would you mind taking it off? I'm an idiot, are you, anyway? I wondered why folks have been kicking me all the Here, I'll take it off. I have to put that on in the parking lot. See, I went to pick up my car about an hour ago, and I discovered the hood ornament was missing. Yep. Two of the hubcaps gone. Right. Well, will you take the case? What do you want me to do? 
I want you to find him, Crescendo. Well, uh, where were you parked? Over in the parking lot on 12th and Main. You know, I come fairly expensive. A hundred fish a day plus expensive. <laughs> hundred fish a day, you're kidding. You laughing at me or my piano, buddy? <laughs> Either way, you're going to get a fat lip. Well, I guess you know a hundred bucks a day to find a hood ornament and two hubcaps is uh, pretty steep. Well, um... Go ahead, go play some more. Don't mind me. Oh, I was going to say... Let's talk this thing over. Well, I was going to say about uh, $90. Uh, oh, come on, Christian. Expensive. This, uh, this job, you ought to be able to work this out in well, I, two or three hours' time. I think I know who did it. The kid in here a few hours ago, a nervous type, looked like a fellow who'd grab a hood on him. Is that so? Did he have, uh, have anything with him that looked suspicious? He had a, uh, kind of a hood ornament on his jacket. Yeah. At the time, I thought it looked like something that would come from a shape like a big bird? Yeah. Yeah, I can put my hands on that right away. How about hubcaps? Did he have any of them with him? I couldn't see that. How about uh, $30? Oh, come on. If he says something like five or ten, I would... Hey, is that the kid over there, the one with the... the... I'm not saying till you give me my two bucks. Oh, wait just a second, uh, Crescendo. Hey, kid. Where'd you get that hood ornament? The way it goes for me all the time. I'll be back again next week. Don't you miss it. Tonight we want to take up a rather serious problem that's oh, come to our attention, boy. and uh, we have gone to some effort to present a well-rounded picture of this problem. We hadn't realized just how great it was until the facts were all across our desk. Here we are now, then, with the Bob and Ray Report. Uh, more or more frequently, I think 
we will have served a great I purpose. think we all understand that, Mr. King. What is the primary danger mm. in uh, this uh, amount of pocket fuzz being uh, uh, around in pockets throughout the country? Well, the, the, the principal danger is this. What we want to do is have the people uh, uh, empty their pockets in sections. Uh, there's a danger that uh, everyone will get the idea to empty their pocket fuzz at the same, same time, time, and then uh, the country is in a serious problem. Throw us out of uh, What we want to do is to have the Northeast uh, do it uh, Monday through uh, Wednesday. Uh, and then uh, the Southeast, uh, maybe Thursday through Friday. Right. And then uh, take the weekend off. Well, and then go out the West Coast again, Monday through Wednesday. You see, so as to balance the fuzz. Well, I think that uh, that is a very constructive idea. But to find out just what the average man is doing about the problem, let me call in my broadcasting partner, Artie Skirmahorn, in the street below as he chats with passers-by. Come in, Artie, please. Hello, everybody. This is Artie Skirmahorn. Uh, here is part of the Bob and Ray report on pocket fuzz. Uh, uh, sir? Yes? I wonder if uh, if you could uh, speak into our microphone and give us your impressions of uh, of the fuzz problem. As well, you, uh, I had been uh, unacquainted with it until uh, I heard the announcements on the radio about it and saw the big posters going up on the street corners and uh, on the delivery trucks. Yes, that poster, I might point out, shows a man emptying his pocket saying, have you done it? Right. Well, immediately after I read that, I uh, began to think about the Sir, problem. Yes, I wonder, just for the sake of uh, of, uh, of describing the, the problems, would you empty your right to coat pocket now? Let's see how much yes. fuzz you have accumulated there. All right. Here's the... As he's doing that, I might point out that the fuzz uh, is being uh, gathered now uh, at uh, various points in the northeast of Newport, uh, Rhode Island. It's uh, bailed, uh, this park of fuzz, and it's taken to sea and dumped. All right, sir, now what... Uh, well, there's exactly? a good half a handful, right? Look, here. I'm getting a signal report <laughs> to uh, hurry up, so would you speed along? Well, I'm going to empty this pocket, then when I get home, I'll empty the other ones. We must go now to Fentra Simon, who's at Capital City, talking with the governor. This is Fentress Steinam in the office of the governor at Central City. Governor, uh, what is the state doing uh, to meet this uh, problem? I have uh, uh, today authorized the attorney general to check on Fuzzy King. Oh, uh, he is the head of the Citizens Committee uh, against Fuzzy King. This whole thing is a, uh, is a phony thing that's being perpetrated by Fuzzy King for what, uh, what reasons we do not know. Do you tie this uh, problem uh, or this uh, question he has uh, raised, do you tie it in with uh, this being a political year in any uh, respect? I would, uh, wouldn't want to comment one way or the other on that. Right now, I'm interested in uh, seeing if this fellow's up to no good and uh, if he is to put him where he belongs. In other words, your first job point. will be an investigation of Mr. Fuzzy King. First That's thing right. I'm going to do, and then I want to check on Bob and Ray. Thank you, Governor. And now this is Central Sinan and Capital City returning it to New York. And so you have heard the Bob and Ray report on the pocket fuzz shame. The city. Chevalier, fop, charlatan, or whatever he was, heeded the call of his people. Chevalier, I beg of you, do not make this journey. It is a fool's errand. Freedom, Raoul Martignac, is not to be held so lightly that it should not weigh heavily on one's mind. No, Raoul Martignac, I must go to the tavern of the two intertwining roads to see what I can learn. The tavern is still with the minister's secret police. No place for the green picker. It will mean your neck. You're caught, Paul. The guillotine holds no fears for me, Raoul Martignac. It's already been used on me several times. I must go now. Goodbye, Raoul Martignac. Good fortune, magnificent fool. Monsieur, you 
I do not drink your wine. A slight indisposition, perhaps? Well, what name do you go by, girl of the bar? <laughs> I am the famous Marie. Everyone knows me. I will sit in your lap, no? Mary, a lovely name. And your face, it is the face of justice. Am I not correct in this, Marie? I do not understand, Mister. You speak in riddles. And it is dangerous to speak in riddles in a tavern filled with the minister's secret police, no? Monsieur, I have much to do. A moment, Mary. You say you have much to do. I must ask you, the much you have to do, is it in the name of the people? I cannot say, Mister. I, I do not even know who you are. And it is dangerous to speak with strangers. Ah, I am no stranger, Mary. Who are you, Monsieur? You have but to feel the collar of my shirt to know who I am. Why, it's a silken shirt. Then you must be... Quiet, Mary. We have an enemies here. Yes, I am Paul Chevalier, the Green Pickle, at your service. I need information, Mary. Do we understand one another? Perfectly, Monsieur. Attention! Attention, Minister Secret Police! That's right, I just arrived uh, from Amsterdam. I have uh, hidden about my person uh, $4 million worth of diamonds. I see you, that you are a professional smuggler, is that... Uh... That's right, I get a percentage of, uh, of the amount I take in. I've always wondered about the cute ways in which smugglers uh, manage to bring in uh, uh, contraband material like that. Could you tell us? Oh, there are many ways. For instance, on this trip, I'm using hollow shoe heels, and I have a drop-away uh, bottom in the bag. Uh-huh. And this is a fake nose I got. And, uh... Loaded with diamonds. Is that If a... I could sneeze on you like that song says, <laughs> <laughs> you'd be a millionaire. Yes, sir. Well, it's rather difficult, of course, to uh, go into a line of work like this. You must have had to spend quite a while making contact, both... Uh, in foreign countries and here at home. Yes, on both sides. Uh, I have to establish contacts. It's something that uh, you can't go to school to learn. It's uh, yes. only through experience. You have to be able to, uh, 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 you know, get wind of a copper uh, uh -huh. almost uh, instinctively. Uh, there's a lot to learn, but there's a good deal of satisfaction. In, in I should imagine. You can sit at home at night 
knowing that you've done a job well. Done a job well. well. Yes. Have you ever uh, had any uh, close calls at any times when you thought you were going to be arrested? Well, about this time, uh, I, I might be caught because my heel caught in one of those uh, gratings over the hot air oh. system. And you know, these narrow heels that were worrying you. Yes. Uh, well, I got stuck there, and a nice man, a nice customs man, came over and helped me out. <laughs> didn't break the heel or anything? No. Luckily for he, you. Uh, he uh, didn't ever notice at all. Although it took uh, two uh, two men, really, to get, lift my shoe. It's that heavy with diamonds. I see. It must be kind of difficult to walk. I but he say. didn't notice, yes. Yeah. Well, good luck to you, and where will you be going from here? To uh, meet the fence and... Uh... Get rid of everything? Yes, I go from here by cab to a fence in New York City. Then from there, I go out to San Francisco. From there, I'm going to the Far East to do some more smuggling. Uh -huh. So I'll be busy now until my vacation in August. What's that, engineer? Oh, there's uh, two gentlemen over there are, are beckoning to you, ma'am. I think they just want to say hello. Oh, coming, coming. And uh, there she goes across the lobby here at the airport. And uh, is having quite a serious discussion with the two uh, gentlemen who, uh, I wonder, uh, sir, you are one of the two who is talking with the lady. Yeah. I'm Wally Blue on the radio. I'd like to have you come along too, Baloo. Fine. And uh, we, uh, nothing serious, we don't have anything on you. No. Just want you to more or less, uh, you know, uh, confirm what we heard on the radio. Yes. Okay. Come Always on. glad to do my best. All right. And now, this is off, Radio's Wally Ballou returning it to our studio. Entitled Foggy Day at the Seawall is taken from Book IX, Chapter VI, Page One. It's mid morning as we look in on the family. Father and mother are standing looking out the kitchen window. Yes. Father saying, Sandy? Yes. Perhaps it would be a good day to take a stroll down by the seawall. So foggy. Yes. Well, I always like to walk in the fog. Yes, there's something about the fog that... Mysterious. What? Mysterious. Oh. Nice. Why don't you slip on your trench coat and we'll walk down the path. Oh, uh, you hold it for me. Yes. There we are. Yes, yes. Oh, oh. All right. Right down this way. It is foggy. Careful, I can hardly see my nose in front three, of my feet. Three steps there. Yes. Here we are. Now it's a clear path to the seawall. Well, except for the fog. Yes. I often wondered how a sea captain feels out in a deep fog. Six foot. Oh, yes, yes. Six pound, too. I mean, that's... Yes, I've style. often wondered how how ships can navigate in such fog as this. Wouldn't be good for a little boat to... Well, they have radar now, you know. Yes. Hey, you hear anything? Certainly no no big boat. That boat would not have radar. I'm on Jack! It sounds like Jack in his runabout. Oh, it is. Out in this fog. Oh, Jack, my boy. I can't hear you. He's gone way out. He's hey, what's going, he doing on a day like this? Going around in circles, but that's been his life history anyway. Hey, hey. Going and around and in circles since he learned to walk. Yes, yeah. Jack. I'm a hiding. Bring your runabout in this moment. He can't hear you with that motor going, Pa. Yeah. No, I guess he can't. Well, perhaps the fog will lift and he'll be able to see where the dock is. I don't like to have him out there, though. He's been out for how long? Uh -huh. Was he, was he uh, in the house last night, or has he been going around I, all night? I think he was there this morning, yes. Mm. He should be due back in. Maybe he's coming in now. I hope so. Come in now, Jack. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. yes. Yes, he's coming in oh, now. Oh, Jack. He's coming in now. He's landed now. 
Jack, you'd better get up to the house and get some warm clothes. That's what happened. A foggy day at the seawall. You've been listening to One Fella's Family, brought to you as a sustaining feature on the Bob and Ray Show. Today's episode, entitled Foggy Day at the Seawall, was taken from Book IX, Chapter VI, Page 1. One Fella's Family is written and produced by T. Wilson Messy. This is a Messy production. What you're going to say, you're going out the audience. Right. The but first, I think uh, you should inform them that uh, when they rise uh, to uh, pose their question, to give their name and possibly uh, their affiliation if they're with the uh, press association or something like that. Okay, I'll right. do that. Right. Then you step down the steps here from the stage and right to the front row. And uh, <clears throat> this gentleman here, would you give me your name? Him, 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 him. Oh, him, no, I picked, I picked. Go ahead, I'm him. going to pick him. Me, me, him. This one, this fellow right here. Could I have your name and affiliation, please? Yes, uh, my name is Alan Bunchaft. I'm with the Finley Quality. Oh, now, wait, I can't talk to you, sir. We've been, I, uh, been I'd like uh, to ask this question. We've had too much of that. me uh, quite a while. If you say something on the air uh, that shouldn't be said... Can you call the transmitter and have them stop it before it goes up the tower? Yes, as a matter of fact, the speed of sound, sir, and I don't want to get too technical for you because I don't think you'd follow me. Well, we at the Fenley Quality Network well, have often wondered yeah. about this and uh, uh, we don't I know. know who to uh, talk with. No, it's a very the, uh, simple head problem. engineer at the Fenley Quality Network uh, told me yeah. that uh, he, he wasn't well, really up on that. Well, I'll try to answer the question for you if you just stop uh, throwing that name in. Uh, the, the, the speed of sound is uh, quite a bit overrated. If we say something we want to go on the air, we merely pick up this phone here. We call Master Control in through that window. I we see. say, hey, uh, Joe, will you catch that last thing that went out? And we tell him what it is. I see he has uh, a direct line. All right, you've answered him. How about some By others time... before you say it? All right. Run out. Okay, you have one quick uh, question. Helen there. Smith of the Finley Quality Network. Oh, look, I, what have we got uh, for an audience here? Uh, I would like to ask you this. What's a good way to, to cook cabbage without having the odor of cabbage bother you? Well, I don't know. Do you have the answer? A clothes pin over your nose. <laughs> Thanks very much. And give our best. We have that at Finley Quality Network. Yeah, all right. Well, back on stage now. Pierre Dupre, will you come over and sign in, please? Our old friend from uh, the North Country here with us to uh, pay a visit after some three months. After. Hello there, Bob. I'm there, and you too, Ray. Yeah, it's, uh, it was... it's winter time here in the States. Well, it's winter time on top of the North Hemisphere there. Right. I was reading the paper where there was have a heat spell there underneath Australia on it. Yes, well, this is their summertime, of course. Oh, is that right? That isn't what we're here to chat about. It's this little right. item in the newspaper which says Pierre Dupre, log rolling camp, uh, plans to roll a log across the Atlantic Ocean. What is it of this story, Pierre? Well, it's uh, true on it there, Bob. I was uh, going to get on a log there with my hobnail boots, uh, and I was keep the log spin until I was arrived uh, at Europe there. I mean, in France, or maybe, or to England on it there. You mean you're just going Whatever to... Whatever country I would come to, I will stop there. You're just going to keep rolling this log until you hit uh, Europe, huh? Yes, but my brother will be on a boat there in case I would fall off oh, and drown there in the big... Big ocean there because it's deep. In the big I'm drink. used to only the fresh water. To... Well, that's what I was going to ask but you. But this is salt water. There's a difference here on the boy, isn't it? Yeah, well, we have a tank set up for you because I thought you might like to demonstrate for us and for the people in the well, studio. Well, uh, in as much as we're indoors on it there, Bob, I think I'll take off this jacket there and do it just in my shirt sleeve. All right. There's a big log already in there. I don't know how you're going to get on it. You would put salt on the water there? Salt water. Been, uh... Well, it's 
uh, it will be the first time I was due to salt water. I was can do this good on the praise there. But... Well, I think it's time you began to practice. You know. Salt water, they're stronger than the praise. Climbing over the edge of the tank now. Log. Well, all right. Uh, uh, no. Get one foot on the log, and there he goes. That music there was throw my rhythm off there. Will you stop the music? Yeah, stop the music. Uh, Please, uh, that music was throw off my rhythm. I was go left right there, left right. I can't do that with the rhythm on it. But... How long do you think this is going to take you to go across uh, the Atlantic on a log? Oh, that would take me a week at least. Uh, mm-hmm. That's a big water. Uh, well, I know, but you haven't even begun to move around the tank here yet. You're staying in one place. Oh, that is... You all right? I'm wet, man. Oh, a little flag. Oh, I'm a mistake. Oh, he, he has fallen off the log, well, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let, me, let me explain this okay. to you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, in this tank, which is about eight feet deep, uh, here oh, in our uh, studio, uh, Pierre oh, Dupre, uh, the log rolling champ, has fallen off the log and uh, now oh, is floundering the there. there. Webb, I wonder if you'd pull the plug out of the tank. Well, would you, please? Might be a little me. help to him. Here we are. If it's not too late, I certainly hope not. We're all wearing brand new suits today, and you want to get... Pierre? Yes, sir. Are you all right? I'm all right now, but I'm soaking wet there. How am I going to get out of this tank? It's about 15 feet up there. Well, it is bigger than I thought it was. We'll have Rusty, to work. too, you know. It's slippery on it there. Teddy, we'll try to get a ladder for you and get you out before the show is over. I'm full right? like a brass monkey down here. Yes. All right. Well, Pierre Dupre, our thanks to you for dropping by today. And good luck on your well, coming yeah. trip. Good luck to me there. Well, get me out. Are you still going to try the Atlantic? I don't know there. Not until I get out from on inside this tank there. Well, Webb, can you help him come? We have other work to do here. I'll do the best I can. Yeah. I'll drop him down some bouillard. Well, that would be very helpful of you. Maybe a, a blanket or something you could get to you. Know? Make it for tea soup. Tea soup, Webb. Uh, make it. Oh, sir. take too many more like that. Why not? Well, because we're in pretty bad shape around here, especially the morale of the crew. Then pass out some chalk. Let them write messages on a few of the torpedoes. Let me out of That man is hysterical. He's got to be slapped. There he goes, Skipper. Slap him. I had to do that, Fuller. Maybe someday you'll understand. You see, even the best of us are afraid now and then. It's nothing to be ashamed of. I want you to. Fuller, we're going to forget that you punched me. Now get back to your death gauge and watch that needle. See what I mean about the morale of the crew, Skipper? All right, Lieutenant. Tell the crew I've got something to say to them. Man, hold it down. The Skipper's got something to say to you. Men, here it is. The Lieutenant tells me your morale needs a boost. Well, here it is. Szymanski, I want you to break radio silence to send this message to fleet headquarters. USS submarine speckle bass, tired of being sitting duck. Intend to surface, engage enemy, and do a little shooting on our own. <laughs> All right, Fuller. We'll forget that you did it again. Sir, I think the men were looking for another kind of... All right, Szymanski, cancel that last message and send this one instead. USS submarine speckle bass, too proud to be on bottom. Going to top where we belong. Here comes Fuller again, Skipper. Better fend for yourself. I'll do my best. Here's a morale message for you, Skipper. Oh, I gotta get out of here. I can't take it anymore. I don't care about this old stuff. I gotta get out of here. But 
thoughts the skipper did care. And once Fuller's hands were tied to his side, the USS submarine speckled vast performed a clean sweep. saw an interesting thing the other day, and fortunately, we had our wrist tape machine with us. Boy, those come in handy, don't oh, they? Oh, boy, we, we just turned it on and caught this wonderful thing. It was in a restaurant, not too far from Midtown here, so you thread that up. Let's listen to it, shall we? Yes, sir. How many would you be, please? Ah, uh, well, just one. All right, right this way, please. How will this be? This is fine. You see that if you will, I'll get you a menu. Just a Thank you very much. One alone. There you are, sir. Thank you. Anytime you're ready, uh, I'll... Just, uh... Well, this, uh... Do you have a kitty menu? What's that, sir? Do you have a kitty menu? A kitty menu? Yes. Yeah. All right. I like those menus. Well, this is our, our regular menu. We have a children's menu, well, sir. Uh, uh, could I look at look at it, uh, please? For well, why? Well, uh, <laughs> um, well, I don't want to eat this. You know, I just children. You mean so, you want to order from the children's yes, menu? Yes, I like children's portions, and I like to have my meat cut up for me. But you're an adult. I mean, uh, I, this yeah. is kind of irregular, you know? Yes, but it's what I like to. Uh, <clears throat> Could I have Don't you feel kind of uh, silly ordering? Yes, but I wish you wouldn't make so much people look just... Well, I, I'll have to ask the manager. I don't know whether uh, we can let you order from ask, that or not. Ask him if he has turkey lurkey with gravy. Well, if you'll wait just a minute. Because I like that. Uh, sir, Mr. Furphy. Yeah. That gentleman over at table 25 wants a kitty menu. It's oh. never happened before. I don't know whether I should give it to him or not. It's probably some whack. Go ahead, give it to him. It's not right. any trouble. All right, here you are. Oh, the manager thank says you. you. Oh, oh, boy, let me take you. Uh, Humpty Dumpty egg salad, little Miss Mustard, curds and white pudding, old Mother Hubbard spoonless. Chicken. You're bending the menu, the old woman in the shoe menu there, sir. If you... That's nice, isn't it? Uh, we think it's nice. rather cute mm-hmm. for the Well, I think that's what I'll have. I'll have the turkey lurkey with gravy and cat and fiddle mash squash. Turkey lurkey with gravy. And, uh... Uh, I'm winding up with a silver bell and cockle shell salad, sir. All right. And then Fine. for dessert, I think I, I'll have the, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> curds and whey pudding with a lollipop in it. All right. I'll, I'll be right back. Thank you very much. That was a tape end, wasn't it? Right there, yeah. <clears throat> he was a whack. We it, uh, it turned out he was crazy. in New Hampshire about to take place is the famous February 8th parade, which has been something going on up there on the 8th of February for, I don't know, as old as the Boy Scouts of America, I believe. Bob and the horns here on the floor? Yes, so I can... Wally Blue is is up there, and he's going to broadcast what we hope will be the uh, highlight of that parade. Come in, then, please. Wally Blue. Seen here on the corner of Maine and Spruce Street. And uh, presenting the uh, famous February 8th uh, parade. Just a few feet from me is my ex-broadcasting uh, partner, Artie Skirmahorn, who's covering uh, the parade for another network. And uh, I hope uh, his voice isn't confusing you folks with too much. Down the street... Uh, the first parade the group, a uh, group of high school students, group of parade that is coming now. Group of high uh, school just, students. Uh, almost reaching us. They are just, uh, just what, a moment. They can't turn off from us uh, here. Honey, I wonder if you turn right the here. other way, please. We're picking you up, my engineer tells me. Well, ladies and gentlemen, but, uh, uh, I'm picking my engineer now. We're picking up Wally Blue on our on our network. A very colorfully attired group of high school students. I might, uh, uh, Carrying a big banner. Many hours, obviously, uh, getting their uniforms ready. They're beautifully attired. They're uh, carrying a big banner that says right. February 8th, 1960. Uh, there's a banner that uh, they're holding. 
is February 8th, well, there's 1960. A tremendous ovation from the crowd well, here. They really, really love it. As the group I call it a tremendous by. ovation they're receiving. And uh, they go by. Uh, the, uh, Friday, we're there. picking you up again. Is that engineer? Uh, now, one of the high spots that we've been waiting for, we're the here. famous... Wally, I'm afraid uh, we're picking you up on our microphone here. Well, I was so here for... Just clam up, Mushmouth, Mouth, and uh, give me an opportunity my, to broadcast with the thinly quality... Network my equipment. employers made the arrangements for this parade that it was supposed to here be exclusive. Here is the, probably a highlight of the parade now, the famous... Uh, the famous bagpipe band of Sunapee, New Hampshire, now, is making yeah. its way... Making its way... Down the street. Coming down the street here. And it will turn, of course, following the ratified. Turn the uh, left up above, following the parade route. After that, the float will be uh, uh, course, coming we'll along. If I see two. the first one, I think I see the first one now. I think the uh, uh, coming into view now is the first one. That's the second one. I see the second then one. The second one, of course. And I see the third one. And the third one. And I can see four or five more that Hardy Skirmahorn yes, can't see from this are, uh, point. Five or six uh, more uh, coming along. Uh, another cheer goes up from the crowd. And that's right. Well, you probably here. heard was cheering just then at the uh, first float. Uh, it was a great cheering uh, as the first float passed our broadcasting uh, vantage point and, uh, and uh, made its way off mm. by the town hall. Then we pulled the network. It's glad to be here. Just uh, right yeah. on my yeah. microphone that time, buddy. To uh, cover this, uh, and we're not this here. parade. Come on, sir. Not over this way. We uh, might uh, point well, out. Ray, it's been our most right colorful here. day. Of course, it's led with the beans. Remember, summer. friends, whenever but you want ice cream, be sure to ask for Leo's ice cream. I think your commercial... Leo puts good, heavy, rich cream. You're leaking commercials on a wire network, uh, Artie, and I can't stand any more of it. special is Cherry Jubilee. And so now... Uh, rich, rich vanilla. So I hope you've been able to vanilla. make out the broadcast of this colorful um, day. And just about ready to conclude the broadcast. Back to our and main now, studio. To our main studio in Portland, in Augusta. Well, thanks, Wally, and uh, he was having a little interference with somebody. Oh, oh, oh Addy Scramblehorn uh, uh, really has. I guess Turn we, the we should have mentioned that Artie left our employers of the first of the year and went with the other network. And uh, Wally may be running into trouble with him. Right now, as a matter of fact, uh, we got him right out on an assignment to City Hall. 
talking to a lucky youngster down there. You may have read about this, you folks in this in this Bay Area. So uh, if you're down there, Artie, come in, please. Seated behind the mayor's desk here at City Hall is a youngster from Stephen Weems High School. His name is Edward Cruz. And his prize-winning composition on Civic Pride has won him the title of mayor for a day down here. It's all pretty exciting, isn't it, Ed? Well, oh, so far, not too much has happened. Just a lot of handshakes from these people around here. <laughs> well, as far as you're concerned, Ed, the title of mayor is an honorary one. Honorary my foot. I didn't break my back for six months on that composition just so I could sit behind this desk. I'm looking for a little action here. Oh, uh, now, Ed, that's all very commendable, but... Uh, you don't have the maturity, the know-how uh, to run this big, huge uh, office. Hello, Captain. The newspapers call me again. They want action on Culver. Look, Captain, I don't care if you have to put 3,000 men on the case. I want Culver in the DA's office no later than 3 this afternoon. Now move. Uh, Mr. Mayor, the governor is here to see you. Take it easy, Irene, and send him in. Uh... You want me to leave? No, I'll sit right over there. We have nothing to hide. Ed, we're in trouble. Real trouble. Lonergan called. Hal, sit down and take it easy. Uh, drink a drink, Al. Uh, look, Ed, I don't think you understand. Say, who's that guy sitting over there? Oh, he's a reporter. A reporter? Ed, are you crazy? Why, if word got out of there. Al! This guy got the story? Al, listen to me and listen good. We've got nothing to hide, have we? But, uh... Now, listen to me. Lonergan can't touch you. I sent Woody to the State House this morning to get the records. Ed, I, I don't like this. It's not the way to do it at all. Now, baby, play ball with me on this. We can come out of it hurting if you don't. All right, Ed. But I'd hate to be the one to tell Joe Denker about it. Well, we knew someone had to suffer, Al. Denker had to go. It was the only way we could... Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor, it's... Joe Denker, he's out here, and... Al, Denker mustn't see you here. Take the back door. Be careful with him, Ed. I'll call you later. Mr. Mayor, I couldn't stop him. He's on his way in. It'll be all right, Irene. Well, 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 Chris, is that, that big man himself? Sit down, Joe, and let's talk this over. Who's the guy sitting over there in the front? He's a reporter, Joe. A reporter. Well, well. Say, Mr. Reporter, how would you like to hear a story, a sad one? Joe, go on and get some rest. You look tired. Hear that, Mr. Reporter? Mr. Mayor wants me to go home and get the rest. Joe, this isn't the place. It's the rest, he said. Now, that's what I call funny, Mr. Reporter. You know why it's funny? Because Mr. Mayor and his boys just thought to it that I'll be getting all the rest I need, didn't you, Mr. Mayor? Joe, I know you're uh, unhappy. Unhappy? But... You're crazy, Mr. Mayor. I'm glad to be leaving. It's the biggest break of my life to be able to get out of this black political ocean that covers and pollutes until a man loses his self-respect. And they all go under. Unhappy, you say. Do you know what my eyes are going to be saying from today? Happy days are here again. <laughs> and I didn't expect it as long as you Why do you do it? It's the system that's rotten, Joe, not me. And this is Artie Skirmahorn sending you back to the studio. Great reporting, Arthur Skirmahorn, and a notable contribution on your first day back with Boy, the Robin Ray staff. Last time you had a good scoop like Boy, that. Boy, hey, that was heart-rending and dramatic. Well, we'll read about Mr. Danker, I'm sure. He's going up for a long rest, as he says. Yeah. I got to talk to Artie about that. Yep. Yeah, well, it'll be good to be working with him again. Big doings out there. In Squaw Valley, of course, was the Winter Olympics just about ready to start. I guess next week they get on the way, don't they? The 18th, yeah. The 18th of the, this month. So uh, Wally Ballou is out there, and I hope he's enjoying himself. Come in, then, from Squaw Valley, not too far from Lake Tahoe. Make believe. In Nevada, Squaw Valley in California. And I believe it's right. They were calling in Wally Ballou. Transcribed Wally Ballou here at the Lala Bend, uh, ready to get a little bit of the color 
uh, of the uh, background, uh, so to speak, of the Winter Olympics. Just a moment, someone is beckoning me, wants to give me uh, a word. Just a moment, friends, please hang on. Wind, I'm told, is augmented, and uh, my engineer has just reminded me of that uh, fact. I'm glad you did, uh, Ernie. Uh, here at the Slalom Inn, uh, evidently most of the guests are out uh, skiing or enjoying the uh, sports uh, spectacle, the practicing, which of course is going on, but the manager is uh, standing here in front of this warm, simulated fire, and uh, I wonder uh, if I could speak with you just a minute. You are the owner of the, of the inn as well as the manager, aren't you? Uh, that's right, uh, Mr. Ballou. This is my inn that uh, I opened 11 years ago here at the uh, Squaw Valley. Well, I think I was probably one of the three or four original people who uh, who noticed uh, how nature had uh, had turned or made this valley into a beautiful winter sports area. certainly was a good choice, but as much as now you're probably overrun with uh, folks uh, coming out here for the next week's event. Well, uh, it's very busy uh, now, and I have no idea. I don't do any uh, any advertising of uh, that is in a large scale. I have a few stickers that put. I have one of the boys put on car bumpers out in the parking lot. But uh -huh. beyond that, uh, there's no uh, organized advertising campaign. So I have no idea. Unless word of mouth, of course. How many out. people are staying here right at the present time? Well, I imagine you're filled with capacity. Well, right? we are. We're uh, we're all uh, filled up, and I'm more than delighted. And I uh, can't understand it. Uh, I uh, do notice uh, a good many uh, uh, what I would call a foreign uh, languages and accents. I don't understand that well, particularly. Well, that's pretty uh, natural, yes. What do you and, mean? Uh, <clears throat> well, with the Olympics, I mean. Now, uh, getting on to uh, some of the other sidelights, do you have any but, of the uh, stars? Uh, wait a minute. Let's go back. Uh, what's, uh, what do you mean Olympics? What's this? Well, the Winter Olympics, which uh, gets underway uh, here in Squaw Valley next week. Probably the reason why you've got uh, such a full house and... Uh, so Whether, many people uh, are speaking foreign languages. Because the world takes part of this. Oh, I, uh, Winter Olympics? I, uh, I've heard nothing about this. Nothing at all. Well, I'm sure they're going to be held here. I haven't heard anything to the contrary. Well, uh, gee, that's Have funny. Have anyone mentioned it to you, sir? Not a word, but then I haven't been in town. I mean, I stay uh -huh. here and I'm out in the kitchen most of the time. Well, I guess you've just been fortunate without even knowing it. Kind of stumbled into something. Well, this is uh, very exciting. I did notice now, you know, that sign, uh, what is that? It looks like the, they have all those rings are together and all looks like that. That's the symbol of it, yes. Oh. Oh, I think maybe you can... Well, uh, that accounts for all those accents, doesn't it? That's right, yes. There are people here from all over the world. Well, I'll be hog tight. Well, good luck anyway, and uh, we hope to see you uh, when we come back next week to cover the actual event. I hope you will, Mr. Ballou, and won't you be my guest here now for a blast? This is Radio Wally Ballou, uh, standing uh, in front of the simulated fire at Squaw Valley, returning you to the... One of our old friends is in town, a gentleman that uh, we haven't talked with for some several months, pretty near a year, I guess. Prentice L. Wilson, ladies and gentlemen, who tips the scales at uh, what? You put on a little weight, Prentice. I have uh, over the past year. <coughs> Excuse um, me. I put on uh, almost uh, three quarters of an ounce, and it really shows. Prentice uh, stands 11 inches tall, and uh, I wonder if uh, somebody would help him up on the table here so that uh, we can have a little Hi again, everybody. You. Bob, uh, good to see you again. I've been listening to your program. Uh, How do you like them, Prentice? I know uh, I've been, uh, very been a busy. fan of ours for some years. Yes, I have, and I still have a lot of mail, Bob, uh, at home that uh, my wife and I uh, like to read, uh, commenting on my uh, last appearance. Uh, so many people around the country could hardly believe that... Uh, a man my size uh, could get about as well as I do and be as successful in the business world. Mr. Wilson is engaged in uh, manufacturing accessories for automobiles. Uh, Rearview mirrors, Rear Bob, mirrors. and uh, all <coughs> sorts of chrome items that uh, people put on their automobiles. It's, uh, and despite his size, I will say for him, because he's quite uh, modest, he does command a great deal of respect. Thank you very much, Bob. I work with him. 
As I've said before, though, I think a person commands as much respect as he deserves. You're a big man, Prentice L. Wilson. Despite you. Now, wait a minute. Well, I didn't mean that. Well, uh, don't sounds... start uh, making those slide type remarks. I didn't mean it that comments. way. It, it slipped yeah. out. But uh, sitting here as I am, uh, and, looking uh, at you, it, 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 it's difficult not to say something wrong from time uh-huh. to time. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, as you know, Bob, I never I mean, come I remember here to I... make a spectacle of myself, nor certainly no, I know. to be ridiculed. I know, certainly. And, uh, uh, I could spend my time a lot more profitably elsewhere, if that be the case. I remember putting my foot in it last time you were here by uh, calling attention to the cute little suits that you wear. And I know that that brought a flush Well, you're doing it again to... just by recalling well, I... uh, these things, Bob. This is the type of and thing I... I want to keep away from this time. Please. I think, I will. believe you told us your wife makes those, doesn't she? That's right. She uh, makes these from swatches mm-hmm. uh, that she gets uh, from uh, from my tailor. See, I, I can't go in and buy a suit off the rack, being only no, one inch tall. No, not even go to the toddler's department, I don't think. Uh, you know what I mean. Uh, you really well, could. You want me to go along, I gather, right? No, I don't. Uh, because I'll be pleased to. My chauffeur is downstairs. I and, want uh, you to stay, Prentice, believe me, and I know Ray would, too, if he were here. Uh, it's As I said, it's difficult to carry on a conversation with a man 11 inches tall without uh, stepping right. on something from time to time. You see, now there you are again. Uh, I wasn't referring to you. I, I, I'm, uh, I'm sitting here comfortably on the edge of your ashtray, and you're you're going to insult me now, I suppose, no, as long I, as I remain here. I don't, and I don't want to insult you at all. That's uh, the further. Let, let's change the subject altogether. He's delighted. Get off onto something else. Uh, seen any good movies lately? Did you see Tom Thumb? It was oh, I'm. Uh, did you see uh, <clears throat> what Big other movies? Sky, I saw. Yeah. I've been doing it very much. Good. Ben Hur, I saw. Oh, certainly uh, a couple of good ones there. Uh, oh, ben Hur. Uh, I read that in one of the columns. Yes. Yeah. How about your preferences in uh, food? I think the folks might be interested to learn just what. Uh... Oh, I like a hero sandwich. Mm-hmm. And occasionally, Bob, <clears throat> excuse me, for a change of pace. And, uh,. I'm trying to think. Well, of course, I love it. Well, a good man sized steak, steak is uh, something that has What did you say then? Huh? What did you say then? I said a, a steak is hard. Oh, you said man sized steak. Yes, I did. I... Well, Bob, you're just trying to upset me. No, time please, little... really. No, I'd rather stay longer, Bob, but uh, I think I, uh... it's just impossible for you. Oh, here comes Ray. Not uh, to be antagonist. Ray's coming through the door now. Attitude toward me. Ray, I wonder if you could uh, help out with Prentice here. Hey, I see how it. are you, Tiny? <laughs> oh, no. Oh, I'm that getting out of here. Ray, you've really angered him now. That isn't helping. That is any. I'm afraid I, uh, I kind of... What are you uh, anyway? Well, I didn't, I I didn't make mean it. Well, I don't know. He's always had a good sense of humor before, and... Uh, He's yeah, a terrific a tiny little guy. Terrific. He doesn't, like, doesn't like to be referred to as that. No, I know he doesn't. <clears throat> doesn't like it. 